came to rejoice. I came to rejoice. One, two, three. So we have a lot of people here tonight for your first time. Hold your hand up high. You're here for your first I thought so. <laughs> well, you may as well have fun. You're already branded with being here anyway. Your friends all drove up on the parking lot, saw your car, and you're, they think, well, he's at that weird church. You may as well have a good time anyway. <laughs> God is so good, isn't he? He is so good. He is so good. Hallelujah, Lord, I bless you. There is nobody like you, Father. Nobody in the whole earth, in the world, heaven, or the heavens beyond what we see, there's none like you. Nobody can compare to you, Lord. <laughs> I came to praise him. You can watch me if you want. Oh, nobody like you, Lord, I praise you. <laughs> I love you, Jesus. I praise you, I praise you, I praise you, Lord. Bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father.
step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you and here I to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me
if you're visiting for the first time, let me see your hand again. We want to welcome you. So many of us don't, in our lives, they're so fast and so furious. I think Satan has taught us well how to be busy. But when you receive from the Heavenly Father, you have to stop time and be still. If you're here tonight for your first time to Brownsville, we want to welcome you, but want to encourage you. Just like a dry sponge, soak him in. Because he's here. And if you'll soak him in tonight and open up and let him fill you, he'll change your life. You'll leave this place changed. He's changed hundreds of thousands of lives before you've come. But he still has plenty. So I encourage you to soak in his presence. Get prayer. I encourage some of you older folks that's been coming, you need to soak too. He's a good God. God, you are my God.
tonight who want to open up and receive. How I thirst for you. Tell him about it.
seated. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's in the house. choir can go if you want to. Last, well hang around, it's going to get better. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's here. He's here and sometimes you do strange things when he comes. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's a healer. Last night, uh, last week, y'all really can go. Last. Well, stay here then. Last week, we had prayer time at the end of service and we usually do how many again you're here for the very first time I want to talk to you in a minute all you are here for the first time but um, last week we had prayer time at the end of the service like we always do and uh, God did some awesome things God began a miracle last Friday night and uh, he's told us that he wants to do those things he said greater things Will he, we do than what he did. And we prayed for a lady, and I've got to get the full report, but um, she had some kind of a, a fungus up in, her, up in her head, in her brain cavities, up in the sinus cavities, I guess, and tumor, tumors behind her eyes. And uh, she went to the doctor, and they said, the fungus is all gone. Yeah. So... So this week, they're going to be checking her out on the tumors, and she believes if the fungus is gone, then the tumors are. We believe with her. We believe with her. We put our faith. I prayed for her last week. We all prayed for her. Carol got a hold of her. We all got a hold of her. And the thing that was incredible is fear was a hold of her because of what was going on in her body. But you know, the Lord is a healer. He loves to heal his people. And if you're here tonight and you need the Lord to heal you, he wants to heal you. The Lord wants to touch you. There's nothing you can do to earn it or deserve it. It was paid for by his blood and his stripes. It's already done. The giver works. You just got to fix your receiver. Your receiver's broken and you're not picking up the healing channel. You just have to tune in. Somebody said, what is there, some magic button I hit or something I do or some contrition I move into? 
No, it's because he loves you. It's because he wants to give good things to you. Well, why doesn't he heal everybody? Because he's God and I'm not. I trust him. I trust him. And I know that he's doing something great. Now, if you're here for the first time, would you mind just, I won't take as long as I did last week, but would you stand with me? I don't want to embarrass you. I just want to honor you. If you're here for the first time, well, look at you. Well, wow, that's great. Oh, don't sit down yet. Now, you all are together, and where are you from? Texas. We're in Texas. East Texas, around Tyler. around Tyler, Texas. We've been waiting on you seven years. We're so glad you came. <laughs> how, how did you hear about Brownsville? Uh, a good friend of ours works at the school, Sonny James. Sonny James works at the school. Awesome. Steve Hill was at our church two weeks ago. Steve was at your church, so that'll do it. <laughs> well, bless you, man. Thanks for coming. And where are you from? From the Birmingham area. You're from Birmingham. That's a good place. Welcome. God bless you. You all can be seated. I just want to catch up with some of the folks who are here. Sorry about that, Ray. Now, where are you all from? Ohio. Well, welcome all the way from Ohio. Get down here where it's warm. Yes, yes. That's yes. right. How did you hear about? Well, my son revival, and then my grandson goes to college here. Your grandson goes to college. Hey, dude. Brought him with you, huh? <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. How, and where are you all from? Baby Ned, all of you? Well, welcome. I would shake your hand, but it's a long reach. Welcome. God bless you. You can be seated. Sir, where are you from? Fort Walton. It's good to have you, sir. About an hour and a half over there somewhere. And where are you from? Indiana. Indiana. Where in Indiana? South Terre Haute, a little place called Lenton. I've been to Terre Haute. That's like a big field up there, isn't it? It is. I was there when it was cold. It's getting that way again, and it's good to have you. Thank you, brother. You can be seated. Where are you all from? Ringo, Georgia. It's good. To, Ringo, that's up there almost in Tennessee. That's a beautiful place. Welcome. God bless you. Glad you're here. There's folks right behind you. Where are you from? Taconia, Indi Laconia, Indiana. How did y'all hear about things all the way up there? You got friends in high places, don't you? <laughs> it's so good to have you. You may be seated in y'all. Grand Rapids, Minnesota. It's cold up there. Well, it's good to have you. How did you hear about us down here? Friends? I love those friends. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for coming. All these ladies back here, where you all from? Mount Vernon, Alabama. It's good to have you. How did you hear about us up there in Mount Vernon? Oh, the TV and friends. Friends and TV. Well, I like friends and TV. Thank you. And relatives. Hey, how you doing? And where are you ladies from? All of y'all together. Well, thank you for coming. We, let's give Mount Vernon a hand. It's good to have you here. Bless you. Oh, great. And these folks back here, where are you from? Auburn, Alabama. Oh, we'll forgive you? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Auburn, Alabama. All of you? Awesome. So who told you about this? Friends. Friends. I love these friends we got. Where? Hey, guys. Welcome. We hope you enjoy yourself. Amen. Ma'am, where are you from? California? That's a long way. What city? What city? Reading? That's a beautiful place, too. Well, welcome all the way over from the other side of things. One beach to another. Of course, you're not the beach in Reading. You're up the mountains. Hey, brother, how are you from? Where are you from? Tuscaloosa. I know where that, that is. I used to live in Alabama. I won't tell you, I won't tell everybody else what else is in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. That's where they take all the people who aren't just right down in Tuscaloosa. But there's other good things there too in there, brother. I can say that I'm an Alabama boy. I'm from Muscle Shoals area. You know what that is? It's good to have you here. God bless you. Where are you from, brother? Fort Worth and Denver. Fort, what's that? Fort Worth, Texas and Denver. Two places. I half of you in one place, half of you in Oh, awesome. Well, welcome. It's good to have you here from Fort Worth and Denver. How do you do that? How, I got to figure that out. That'll make my travel a lot easier if just half of me be in two places. Be, where are you from? Plant City, Florida. Plant City. Welcome. I know where that is. And there by Lakeland, not too far, huh? Welcome. Welcome. Where are you from? Daphne. All right. Daphne, Alabama. He knows somebody up there. Where are you from? Pennsylvania. Where? Oh, great. I was in Rearsburg. Do you know where that is? That's 
and if it's up there where all those Dutch people are, where they eat all those dumplings. It's good to have you. Thanks for coming. Yes, ma'am, where are you from over there? Where? Mobile, that's a long way away. <laughs> it's good to have you here. It's funny, it's got, we got folks from Fort Walton and Mobile, and it's like, we've been doing this seven years, and I'm going, I thought surely all the Mobile folks already made it through, but we're glad you came. All right, where are you folks from? Hallelujah, that's awesome. Where are you from? Hen Henderson, Kentucky. Well, we're glad you're here. Bless you. Where are you from? Where? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Brother, where are you from? Salt Lake City, Utah. You came a ways too, didn't you? Bless you. Thanks for coming. Glad you're here. Where are you from? Kingsport, Tennessee. Tennessee. You too? You're from Memphis. We got Tennessee folks here tonight. It's good to have you here. God bless you. Where are you from? Albany, Georgia. I know where that is. All of you are from Albany? Well, it's good to have you here. Is it? Where are you, where are you folks from? Hot Springs, Arkansas. Well, thank you for coming. It's good to hear you. Good to have you here. Did I miss anybody? Oh, the folks over here, all the way over here. You've got to be from a long way away to be all the way over there. Where are you from? Jay, Florida. That's a long way away. It's good to have you. Thanks for coming. Ma'am? Montgomery, it's a pleasure to have you. Tallahassee, God bless you. Thanks for coming. Where are you from, ma'am? In Evergreen, that's, that's a little ways, it's about an hour and a half drive or so. It's good to have you here. You. Yes, ladies, where are you from? Georgia. Where is that? <laughs> it, south, of south of Atlanta. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Now, let me, oh, did I give somebody else? Well, y'all shouldn't have sat all the way up there. We got plenty of seats down here. We can't even get at you up there. Y'all afraid of something? Now, my ears work pretty good, better than my eyes. The gentleman in the blue shirt, could you tell me where you're from up there? You... Birmingham, England. Welcome. In the South, we'd call that Birmingham, you know. And, but it sounded better when you said it. It's a, <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you, brother. Yes, ma'am. Where are you from? Toronto, Canada. I just got off a plane at 5.30 from Toronto. I was downtown at the Civic Center doing a worship conference at your town. And you were here. That's neat. We just all got together. Welcome. Bless you. Glad you're here. Hey, Amen. Well, it's anybody else? I can't even see you. I thought you were doing the camera up there. I'm sorry. Where are you from? Shelby, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for coming. Did I get everybody now? Okay, welcome. We want to welcome you. Can I recommend a couple things to you before I receive an offering? I want to recommend a couple of things to you folks who are visiting for the first time, and that's this. Get prayer at the end of the service. If you come and you don't get prayer, you, 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 you miss the whole thing. It's not that, that we have any kind of prayer that's different in, than anywhere else. It's just that since Father's Day 95, for seven years now, the Lord has been just coming and touching people. He's been healing people. He's been setting people free. He's touched pastors. He's touched pastors who've gone home to their churches and changed their churches. He has done incredible things. So don't leave without getting prayed for. You promise you won't? We'll have a prayer team up here, and they'll pray with you as long as you want prayer. And that's, that's important to get done. I, I'm a prayer, we're prayer hogs around here. We get it all the time. It's wonderful. God is a good God. He wants to touch you. Amen. I see it. Pastor had to run to the hospital, and you see he's back. And I just have a feeling he wants to receive the offering. Just have that. Just, let's make my pastor welcome. God bless you. Pastor. Would you stand, please? Well, hello, everybody. God bless you. Welcome to Brownsville. One more time, could I see the hands of those who's here for the first time? Could I see your hands? Wow, look at this. Very a first time. Bunch of them. That's great. How many of you, uh, you're from outside the state of Florida? Could I see your hand, please? Outside the state of Florida. 
How many of you are Pensacolian people? Let me see your hands. All right. God bless you. Well, tonight we have with us um, our guest speaker. How many of you have ever heard of Damon Thompson? Damon Thompson is a real laid-back, reserved guy. And uh, he's, he's a powerful, I'm, I'm, I'm serious now, he's a powerful preacher of the gospel. He's a wonderful friend of Brownsville. He preaches all over this nation, all over the world, and we're fortunate and blessed to have him here tonight with us. He is of the revival fabric, believe me. And so whenever you hear him, you're going to be blessed. And um, I want to reiterate something that Lyndall just said a moment ago. I want you to be sure and get prayer while you're here. We're seeing God do some powerful things. Just the last several places we've been, uh, probably get about 25 or 30 minutes in the message and the Spirit of God just comes down and I'm telling you, the musicians can't even get to the platform. The Spirit of God will start falling. We'll start praying for people and I mean it is just awesome. So get prayer. You're in Brownsville, friend, of all places. We're not going to think anything about whatever happens to you. We've seen it all, believe me. I was just telling somebody the other day, I'm really big into blessings and um, have been for a number of years, even way before revival broke out. And I remember I called my sons home to pray for them whenever God began to deal with me about the mystery and power of a blessing. And um, I asked them to forgive me for anything that I had ever done, to anything I'd ever said over them in the way of a curse, not cussing, but, you know, curse. I asked them to forgive me for anything I'd ever said that maybe hindered them or or somehow, you know, just where I spoke that over them. And, of course, they both said, oh, Dad, you know, you've been a good dad. I said, I know it, but shut up, listen to me. <laughs> and uh, so uh, they said, you've been a good father. But anyway, I had my sons come up, and I had my oldest son come first, and I laid my hand on him, and as I began to bless him, when I removed my hand, his face was just wet with tears. And when I had my second son stand up, my youngest son, and laid my hand on him, this is before revival broke out, he stood there and started vibrating, just vibrating all over. And I'd never seen that before. I'd seen people, you know, moved upon by the power of the Holy Spirit. But whenever I laid my hand on him and began to bless him, he just started vibrating all over. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't fake that like he vibrated. And when I removed my hand from him, the Spirit of God had touched him in a powerful way. And then I prayed for Brenda, and I asked the Lord to let me revoke anything over my family that I had spoken in any way, accidentally, ignorantly, or whatever, purposefully. I asked the Lord to let me unsay and to revoke anything that I had spoken over my family. And I blessed them, and I released a blessing over them, and to this day, I've never said anything negative over them. And... Um, we begin to bless our homes. I begin to go through the house and bless every room in the house. And it's a strange thing. I've always been a light sleeper. And um, after I bless, you know, I'd go to the bedroom and bless it. And I'd bless the kitchen, the bathrooms, and speak a blessing over each room in the house. And I began to sleep so hard, I'd wake up and there'd be slobber all over my pillow. <laughs> and I told Brenda, I got concerned. I said, Brenda, I said, something bad wrong with me. She said, what is it? I said, well, when I sleep now, I'm just slobbering all over my pillow. I said... Uh, something's wrong. She said, duh, you've been blessing the bedroom, and God's been giving you peaceful sleep. I said, oh, yeah, right, right. That's what's going on. But what I want to tell you is this. A blessing is such a powerful thing. I bless my family. I bless my home. We began to bless the church before revival broke out. Now we're blessing the givers at Brownsville. We're blessing the tithers. You would not believe the testimonies. The thing that I hear the most around Brownsville all the time, the, the most common phrase is, all the time I hear it, Brother Kilpatrick, you just won't believe what God has done for me. And I attribute that to speaking the blessing over this church. And just this week I sat down at home and began to read a lot of mail that came in. And just about everybody that I got a piece of mail from in regard to the blessing said, Brother Kilpatrick, please don't ever stop speaking that blessing. There's nothing magical about it. It's not magical. The words are not magical. Anybody can write their own blessing, but I'm telling you, for so long we've been praying over things that we should have been blessing. Are you listening to me? We don't even know how to bless in the New Testament church today. We say, let's, let's, uh, brother so-and-so, would you please bless the offering? And he'll pray over it. Our most gracious Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name. We ask you, Lord, to bless this offering. 
We ask you, Lord, to bless the offering. When I ask the man to bless it, we don't know how to bless. And then we say we're going to bless the food. Our most gracious Father, we thank you for this food. We ask you to bless this food. You know, there's things that you bless, and then there's things you pray over. Prophecy is prophecy. Blessing is blessing. Prayer is prayer. They're all separate. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to speak a blessing over those of you that give in this offering tonight. I'm going to release a blessing in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to come back and do it after we get through giving. But I want everybody in this place to participate because here's what I sense. On the way into church tonight, I heard the Lord speak to me and here's what he said. He even told me the side of the room he was going to be sitting on. And so I'm, going to, I'm not going to tell you which side of the room it is. But I know which side of the room you're sitting on. And here's what the Lord said for me to tell you. There's an individual here tonight. Come on. You're a woman. You're a lady. And while I was coming in by myself, the Lord spoke this to my heart. And he said, this lady has been through one sorrow after another. And he said, to the point that she's desperate and she's almost in depression. But the Lord said to tell you that whenever I bless you tonight in this offering, he said he has a surprise for you and he's going to turn it around. He's going to turn it around. Now listen. I'm not telling you that you've got to give to get that blessing. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm just saying after we get through giving, I believe that it's going to open up the windows of heaven and God's going to pour you out a blessing. But listen to me. The Lord said he's got a surprise for you. I don't know what the surprise is, but it's going to happen in just a matter of days. You've been so discouraged and you've been so depressed. Well, you know what side of the building I'm looking on. I'm looking over here. It's right over here. And I think the lady knows who I'm talking to. Let's get ready right now and give. We're going to bless Brother Damon Thompson's ministry. Listen, give to Brownsville. Make your check out to Brownsville, and we'll give him the check that comes in. God bless you, Lendl and Choir. Hallelujah. Y'all sing the gospel.
I've always been a firm believer that whenever it comes time for the offering, I've always been a firm believer that everybody should give. Everybody. And there might be those that says, well, I don't have anything to give. I guarantee you when service is over, you'll get a hamburger. Or you'll get a soft drink if you want it. Everybody's got something to give. I don't care what it is, you've got something to give. There's very few people that don't really have anything to give. One of the things that I want to make clear is this. God has blessed us with so many blessings, we don't ever need to take for granted what he's already blessed us with. Amen? And you don't need to be greedy and want to get more blessings added on top of what you've already got. But there's a lot of God's people that needs to be blessed. If you're here tonight and you need a blessing, whatever that may be, you need a blessing. You know, the Lord even said to Abraham about Sarah, here's what he said. He said, I have blessed your wife Sarah, and she shall be blessed. She's blessed and she shall be blessed. And God opened up her womb and she had a baby of her own. She didn't have to hold Hagar's baby. God said, I blessed her and she'll have her own baby. How many, many of you knows that blessings are more than clothes and houses and cars and land? Blessings are whatever God. The Bible says that they come down from the Father of lights. If you need something tonight from the Father of lights, I want you to hold your hand up. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, I speak a blessing. I speak, Lord, that this environment be pervasive with the blessings of the Lord. Lord, we summons them. Every effect of the enemy where the devil would come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, we withstand him in the name of Jesus, and we call the blessings down, and we speak, Lord, that they shall manifest, and your people shall rejoice. They shall greatly rejoice. There's going to be great joy in their camp and in their home as to what God has done for them. Now, Lord, there's many of your people tonight that has needs. And, Lord, every perfect and every good gift comes from the Father of lights. And, Lord, we'll be quick to praise you when it comes because we know the devil didn't do it for us. God did it. In Jesus' name. Would you welcome, please, Damon Thompson. While you're standing up, put your hands straight in the air again. I just feel that God's just in the middle of releasing some things right now. I felt a shift begin to take place probably about 10 minutes ago. And there's some things that are being reversed in your life right now. And there's no need in us waiting until we get to the end and the time is appropriate. If you're experiencing bondage in some area in your life, there is no more appropriate time for you to get free than right now. So I just continue the declaration that's already begun in this place. And I declare liberty beginning to come into your body right now. Liberty beginning to come into your marriage right now. Freedom beginning to hit every situation of your life. And I declare you are being loosed from the attack of the enemy this moment. And you are finding yourself beginning to operate in freedom, in freedom, in freedom, in freedom, in freedom right now. Come on, lift your hands, begin to worship the Lord. Freedom! 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 Woo! Come on, get that, friend. Right now, get that. Get that. Get that. You don't have to wait another minute. You don't have to live like that another minute. God didn't bring you in here tonight to leave you like you are. He came in here to turn things around. You need to get free right now. Woo! Let that stuff hit your body. God didn't build you to live with that mess. He wants to free you from that trash. Feel that stuff. Get in your body right now. Feel God begin to loose you. Mm. Mm. I don't know what you came in here expecting tonight. I, I, I wasn't even sure what I was coming in here expecting tonight, but I feel God interrupting us for the sake of his divine purpose tonight. This is gonna be more than a Friday night service. This is gonna be a divine encounter with the glory of God. You might as well get ready to get free. Is anybody free in here? Whew. Let that thing, somebody's digestive tract, you're experiencing a miracle in your digestive tract right now. I want you to let this stuff start working in that right now. Let it start working right now. 
Put your hand on your belly. Bondrebe stili di biondoko. Bandele ba kandi di ribi kisti ondo. I speak to that infection. I drive you out now by the authority of the name of Jesus and declare complete restoration coming to your body, complete healing coming to your body right now. Come on, if that's you, lift your hands and get that. Go ahead and get it right now. Go ahead and get it right now. Shoo. Hallelujah. Kandi be still gone. Mm, come on, you feel that working in your digestive tract? Where are you? Wave at me. You feel that stuff working in you? Let it go. Let it go. Let that stuff begin to manifest in your body. This power is for you and it's for now. Hallelujah. Mm, go ahead and lift your hands again. Here we are, Spirit of God. We came in here tonight for you. We came in here tonight to receive from you, be changed by you. Our mind is on you. I thank you for what you have done in this place, and I'm glad you're not finished. I thank you for the thousands upon thousands of lives that have been changed, and, and I thank you for the thousands and thousands of lives that will be changed. I thank you not just for what you did. I thank you for what you are doing and what you shall do. Our mind is made up. We are not turning back. We are not giving up. We are not about ready to bail out on your plan. We are going to stick this thing out and see See you do everything you said you were going to do. I said everything you said you were going to do. Every prophetic word. Every prophetic word. I declare it will come to pass. Woo! Somebody ought to give God some praise in here. Come on. He's going to do it. If he said he was going to do it, he's going to do it. He didn't lie to you. He's still doing it. He's still doing it. Hallelujah. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Can you play for me? Before we go any further, I want to do something. This is going to help demonstrate some things I believe the Spirit of the Lord would have us to see tonight. I want to make a statement to you. It's going to kind of be the crux of where I believe the Lord has led us for this evening. This is the statement. The very essence of worship is progression. And when you cease to progress as it pertains to worship, you have limited your ability to enter into new phases of the glory of God. And one of the dangers of the popularity of worship that's been breaking out all over the country now, instead of contemporary Christian bands, everybody's a worship band. Instead of a Christian rap band, Every, everything's worship now worship and that's wonderful because we need to begin to worship God in a greater way but one thing that we've got to understand is worship is not when you continue to reproduce the same thing over and over again and I believe the reason why God had them lay both the tabernacle and the temple out the way he had them lay them out is to teach you that this thing doesn't end at the labor of washing this thing doesn't end at the brazen altar. This thing doesn't end at the menorah of the showbread. This thing is bigger than that. And you've got to go from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from strength to strength. So we're going to begin to worship God right now for a moment before we dive into this text. Let, let me give it to you like this. The Holy Spirit spoke to me some time ago and he said this. He said, the moment what you call worship ceases to be expensive, it ceases to be worship. Hmm. Worship is worth. And when you cease to offer an excessive God something excessive, you are missing every opportunity that is created in His presence. And as we begin to worship tonight and as we begin to jump tonight, I believe some of you went back to that same familiar place in the presence of God you always go. And I believe the invitation has been extended from glory tonight for you to go further than you've ever been. The very essence of worship is cost. You've got to recognize if it's not expensive, it's not worship. I'll, I'll show you out of the scripture. David wanted to make a sacrifice to God. So he went to buy the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. He showed up at Onan's threshing floor and he said, Onan, I need to buy this threshing floor in order that I might make sacrifice to God. I feel the Holy Ghost messing with me right now. He said, 
David, you being the king, you don't need to buy my threshing floor. You can have my threshing floor. And David said a little statement that you've heard preached all of your life. He said, I will not offer that thing to God that cost me nothing. In other words, Onan, you can't give me the floor. I've got to buy the floor because if I don't buy it, it won't really be worship. This thing is costly. And I, I want to tell you, there was a time in my life where I can remember the first time in a church service I ever lifted my hands and worshiped God. My hands felt like they weighed a thousand pounds a piece. Or most of us just, just gave a little, you know, that's enough. I don't want to go too far. People looking at you and people talking about you. But I want to tell you, I didn't think a thing about this tonight. And if I get into the mindset that, oh, I've, I've found out what worship is all about because now I lift my hands, now I jump up and down, now I spin around. Now, I fall, now there's a place that I've never been. I want to go there. I want to go there now. All of the educators and all of the teachers and all of the conferences that I've preached in and sat under and all of the wonderful ministry I've had the opportunity to be a part of at 28 years of age, out of all of the educators and schoolmasters and preachers and teachers I have sat under, nobody has ever taken me to class the way worship has. When I begin to really worship God, I find myself uh, things being invested in me and things being delivered in me and things being birthed in me as I really begin to worship God. So we're going to take a moment more and we're just going to begin to lift our voice. If you want to stand, if you want to sit, if you want to lay on your face, whatever the case, before we break into this text tonight, let's begin to lift our voice and sing. Your mercy goes much deeper. Your Come on, go somewhere. Grace, it rescues me. Go somewhere tonight. Your mercy goes much deeper. Yes. Father, than I can see. Oh, yes. Your mercy goes much deeper. Uh -huh. Your grace, it rescues oh, yes. me. Your mercy goes much deeper.
hands and lift them straight in the air. Take that. God, you're in this place. Oh, we feel you in this place. God, we never get tired of being where you are. Never get tired of your presence. Never, never, never get tired of being in you living and moving and having our being in you we have not had enough we come tonight wanting you like we've never wanted you before change us tonight change us tonight change us tonight change us tonight, change us tonight. oh yes where you are as he continues to play just be seated in the presence of the Lord be seated in the presence of the Lord if you're up here at the altar and you need to stay here you stay here as long as you need to that's good, that's good. I want you to listen to what I'm about to tell you the Spirit of the Lord has been speaking to me I want you to hear something worship was never intended to be convenient it was supposed to be expensive and I believe one of the things that made Jesus so angry with the righteous indignation when he went into the temple and found the money changers there was not simply that they were making money in the temple, but I believe that one of the things that annoyed Jesus about the money changers being in the temple is with the, by their presence of being in the temple, they were making something convenient that was never intended to be convenient. See, what you were supposed to do is you were supposed to raise a ram or a bullock or a goat or two turtle doves and you were supposed to pick the best out of your field and you were supposed to fatten it and you were supposed to bring it to the temple and have the priest make sacrifice for the sake of your sins being remitted for that season. But what they did by setting up those tables there and by selling rams and selling bullocks and selling goats and selling turtle doves was said, you don't have to go through the trouble of raising your own sacrifice. You don't have to go through the trouble of fattening your own sacrifice. All you've got to do is show up, put your money on the table, and we will give you a ready-made sacrifice. Worship was never intended to be convenient. And what we've done is we've established churches all over the country that try to make sure that coming to the house of God doesn't cost you anything. You can't afford to be offended. You can't afford to be aggravated. You can't afford to stay longer than your 45 minutes. And what we've done is we have made something convenient that God never intended to be convenient. And I'm in the process right now in my travels throughout this country. I have for about six years saw the master sit down and make a scourge of small cords. And I believe he's in the process right now of turning some of what we've known as church upside down. And he's once again beginning to release his glory into a house that was built for him instead of a house that was built for us. 
And when you begin to worship God on the basis of who He is instead of the basis of what's comfortable, then you understand the only thing that is appropriate in worship is excess. Let me say that again. The only thing that is appropriate in worship is excess. It is foolish to come in and out of the presence of God with something carnal. Come in and out of the presence of God with something cheap. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's not just talking about money. When you begin to sow excess towards God, you will in turn begin to receive excess from God. That's why we don't apologize for worshiping for an hour and a half. Because I understand much of what you need could happen if you'd begin to travel over into the land of extravagance. Begin to give God something that's bigger than a church or a denomination or your background or what you saw somebody else. And begin to worship God on the basis of what is he worth. Now if you're worshiping God over church, then don't bring anything excessive. If you're worshiping God over music, don't bring anything excessive. But if you're worshiping God over God, you've got to begin to change what you deem as appropriate and inappropriate. And you've got to begin to recognize you can't bring an extraordinary God something average and expect to really get everything God intended for you to have. So when we start jumping up and down in here, start spinning around in here, start falling on our face, start shaking, start laughing, start crying, start jumping up and down, uh, somebody has to help us to the car, and people begin to look around and say, it doesn't take all that. It depends on what you're after. And if you need something average, worship something average. But if you need something extraordinary, begin to give God something extraordinary. I don't know why y'all people that got to go to church on Friday night, go to church on Sunday morning, go to church, go into prayer meeting all the time because you don't understand what we have been called to do. What I've been called to do is bigger than Sunday morning and Wednesday night. I got a God that has given me a destiny, and if I don't tap into the extraordinary, it will not happen. We keep bringing God something that's church of God, assemblies of God, Pentecostal holiness. Word of faith, charismatic, instead of bringing God something worth, worthy of God. And when you begin to understand that this service was not about music and not about choir and not about preaching, it's about God. When you begin to recognize that, then you will literally be forced over into a land of excess. Mm. 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 You know, I, I've been taught all my life. I, I thank God I didn't grow up in a lot of the religious systems that my parents had to grow up in. I've been taught all my life you can't outgive God. I've, I found out you can't outgive God in money. You can't outgive God in worship. You can't outgive God in prayer. And whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And the reason why there are people who come in and out of these services and one person gets free and another person doesn't get free is because of the seed that is put in the ground when we begin to worship God. I've, heard, I've seen people coming in and out of these revival services, sit down, walk out, say, I didn't feel anything. I saw somebody over there shaking, but I didn't feel like shaking. I didn't feel like falling. I didn't because somebody started reaping what they were sowing. And as long as you're sitting still sowing nothing, you're going to sit still and reap nothing. But I've made up my mind if anybody's going to reap, I'm going to reap because I'm going to be in the middle of the sowing. Woo! And you know what? Some of you are not reaping what you reaped in 96. You need to check what you're sowing. If you feel like God has lifted himself from you, then you need to begin to study the word of God, not what preachers have said about God coming and going. God let you taste that because he intended for you to walk in it constantly, not occasionally. And if you're not walking in it, it's not because God got tired of touching you and God got tired of helping you and God got tired of revealing himself to you. It's because you quit sowing. You thought that seed you sowed eight years ago was going to last you forever. But I found out you got to rise early in the morning. Let your song begin to touch heaven. God will continue. Let me tell you something. I don't care what happens to anybody else. Revival will never stop for me. 
If, if it hadn't happened 38 times already, I'd tell all of you that were first-time visitors to raise your hand in here tonight. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I came in here as a first-time visitor. In here as a first-time visitor, as a preacher, as a minister. I came in here and I was, man, I was ready to see what this was all about because by God, I, I was, God was raising me up, sending me around the country to deliver all these wonderful messages. I came in here as a preacher, walked in here with my stuff together and left a man on fire. So you better be careful coming in here and think you're just going to participate in a service. If you begin to enter into this worship, this stuff will get on you and turn you upside down. So don't think you can come in this thing and stay average. Don't think you can come in this thing and stay normal. Don't think you can come in here and stay complacent and mediocre. It won't happen. God will get in you until you begin to start prophesying to everything you see. Start releasing fire into everything you see. And you won't go to revival. You'll become a revival. There's a lot of people on earth waiting on a move of God. Some of us have figured out we are a move of God. God's in us, and when I move, He moves. You hear what I'm saying? You become a walking, living, breathing expression of the manifest glory of God in the earth. And when that starts to happen, it is immaterial whether 2,000 people are here or if you had the Bible study with three. You understand where two or more are gathered together in His name, there He is in the midst of them. People that bailed out on revival never had revival. They loved church, they got around high church, they got around exciting church, but they never let what was going on in there start going on in them. I'm telling you, friend, one of the most valuable things I have ever and will ever possess in my life is the manifest presence of God, and I'm not about to quit on it. I've preached with it, and I've preached without it, and I'm not going back. No, I've laid hands on people with it, and I've laid hands on people without it, and I'm not going back. I've prayed with it, and I've prayed without it, and I'm not going back. I've worshipped with it, and I've worshipped without it, and I'm not going back. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody tonight needs to make up your mind. I'm not about to quit on what God's doing in me. I'm going to stick it out until it comes to pass. Being a real manifestation of the glory in the earth is so expensive, most people will never do it. And everybody got in the line when they thought it was going to be cheap and easy. But the moment they found out this line didn't lead toward cheap, and it didn't lead toward easy, and it didn't lead toward popularity, all of a sudden they began to back off and go back to what they were doing before. But this junk has messed me up. I'm telling you what, friend, this stuff still gets in my car. This stuff still gets in my house. This stuff, not just when I'm preaching, not when I'm on my way to preaching. This stuff will still wake you up in the morning if you'll sow toward it. This stuff will still wake you up in the middle of the night with stammering lips if you'll sow toward it. Who am I preaching to in here? You need to get your mind back on what God wants to do. All that trouble and all those problems, I got a newsflash for you. Most of that stuff you had when you got into revival... But you got your mind so stayed on him that you entered into perfect peace. I will keep him at perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. And some of you have looked for a life without trouble. That's a long look. You've got to enter into that place where you are so overwhelmed with what's going on in you that you cease to be affected by what's going on around you. Because there's always going to be stuff going on around you. I said there's always going to be stuff going on around you. But when you got your mind on what God's doing in you, you cease to be moved by what's going on around you. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Whew. I don't mind people who don't know anything or have anything or know anybody, or, but I'm aggravated by people who quit. Quitters aggravate me. I grew up, I, I grew up, I learned, how, before I ever preached, I learned how to lead in the, on the field of athletics. My father, I talked to him just before the service as a coach, and they had a football game tonight, and I was talking to him about what was, and I'm going to tell you, I learned, I learned some lessons that you do not want to go to war with people who have quit in them, because they can all talk a good game, but when the bullets start to fly, you find out who's really in this thing for the real deal, who's really going to stick it out. I, I need to know whether the people I'm in this army with are going to a parade or to a foxhole. 
because the line to the parade, that's where all the people who like to dress up and act like they're soldiers go. And the line where the foxholes are, that's the people who are really getting some things done in the earth. And I believe you're here tonight because you are called to be more than a person who goes to good services. I believe the moment every person is born again, the seed of a divine purpose begins to grow in them. You cannot be washed in the blood of Jesus, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and be afforded the luxury of being average. Listen to that. Even if you're common, even if you're ordinary, even if you're middle of the road, what God invested in you is far from ordinary and far from the middle of the road. So what you've got to begin to do is you've got to begin to war against hell according to what God has put in you, not according to who you are. God, I might get to this text. That's the thing that aggravated me about the disciples on the boat in the storm. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Even if you thought you could drown, you should have known he couldn't. So even if the people, all, even, even if all of the disciples are normal and the boat is normal and the water is normal and the wind is normal, the one sleeping in the bow of the boat is far from normal. And you've got to receive, oh Lord, you've got to receive confidence if not based on yourself, based on your cargo. Because the storm's going to blow. But I guarantee you, if I go stick my head on the breast of him, we are not going to die. God is not about to drown. That means I'm not about to drown because the greater one is living on the inside of me. Freak out over what? Freak out over what? Live in fear over what? I refuse to live in fear. Look what I'm carrying. If you're going to kill me, you got to kill that. You ain't going to kill that, Jack. They've been trying to kill that for years, but you kill it in three days, it'll get back up. And the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead has quickened your mortal body. I'm not going to walk around living in fear, doubt, unbelief. Forget that foolishness. Sniper this, sniper, I don't give a rip. He ain't going to kill me. Put a bullseye on my chest right now. I'll paint it on here for you. I'm still not going down, Joker. I got too much word to die. You hear me? I got too many, too many prophetic unctions moving around on the inside of me. There are places he said I was going to go. I haven't gone yet, and I'm not going to die until he says it's time. The greater one is in me. David said, y'all know you people don't know why y'all should be freaking out. The dude who invited me to the throne is now throwing spears at me. But I'm not going to freak out because the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me. I will not fear. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. One thing, not two things, not three. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Then shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about. I will say of the Lord, he is my rock, my strength, my refuge. My God in him will I trust. When thou saidest unto me, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. You will never be as effective as you can be until you get delivered from the possibility of not making it. I tell people all the time, I say, if you're going to really be effective in the kingdom, first thing that's got to happen to you is you get delivered from the opinions of people. Most people don't get in revival, not because of the devil, not because of the weird stuff, because of other people's opinions. I'm not falling in the floor. Stay standing up then. But I found out every time I hit that floor and get up, I'm changed. I, I'm 6'2", 205. If something I can't see can knock me down, I'm getting up different, Joker. You can count on it. 
Hello? You got to get delivered from the opinions of people and then you've got to learn to be delivered from the threats of the enemy. I want to tell you this and we're going to get into this text. If the devil could kill you, he'd shut up and do it. How many of you know what talking trash is? Now, when I, when I was playing ball, I love when somebody starts talking trash to me. Because you knew you couldn't beat me. If you could beat me, you'd shut up and win. But the reason why you're trying to get in my head is because you can't beat me with your feet and your hands. People who can win just shut up and win. People who can't win will try to get in your head and get you to beat yourself. Oh, Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Are you ready for this? I feel the Holy Ghost messing with some folks in here. You're going to leave this place swinging from the rafters. Hey! Verse 17, verse 31. First uh, Samuel 17, 31 records these words. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail him. Thy servant will go out and fight. And let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy father's servant kept his sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Let me read this to you out of the New Living Translation. Again in verse 31 of 1 Samuel 17, Then David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Don't worry about a thing, David told Saul. I'll go fight this Philistine. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There is no way you can go against this Philistine. You are only a boy, and he has been in the army since he was a boy. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep, he said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock. Mm. Say a lamb. lamb. Come on, say a lamb. lamb. I go out after it with a club and take the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he hath defied the armies of the living God. The reason why David never had a problem believing he could defeat Goliath is because he'd been in school for it. Everybody wants to focus on whipping Goliath, but you, you, I don't care how big he is. I choose to fight any man on the planet before I'd fight a lion or a bear. I don't care if he's 12 foot tall, weighs uh, 1,143 pounds. I don't care how much the head of his spear weighs. I don't, none, none of that. I don't care how much. I don't care how big his armor bear has got to be to carry his shield around. If you give me the option of fighting a man or fighting a bear or a lion, I'll take the man. My daddy always taught me, you either fight somebody you can whip or you fight somebody you can outrun. But don't you ever fight somebody that can whip you and outrun you. And I want to tell you, the bear and the lion can whip you and outrun you. Hello? Why didn't David freak out over Goliath? Why wasn't he afraid of Goliath? Because he had been taking care of bears and lions. He had already killed the king of the jungle. He didn't have any problem killing the giant of the Philistines. I want you to see something. When the word of the Lord came unto David at Jesse's house through Samuel the prophet and told him to be king, the moment he received the word about being king, it did not cause him to be off limits to the attack of the enemy. A lot of people get aggravated, uh, but I, I, I'm telling you how I am about the prophetic. When somebody begins to prophesy to me, I don't jump up and down near like I used to. I mean, when I, before I got in the ministry and they used to tell me I was going to the nations, a man, I'd run around, jump up and down, spin around, and then I got in the ministry and started going to the nations. And now when they start telling me I'm going to the nations, I sit down and say, here we go. Don't, don't let me jump up and down on this one because all that stuff I got excited about before didn't put me in the middle of anything but a fight. Hello? He said, you're going to be king over the nation of Israel. 
And the moment the word was released about his destiny, opposition began. And unless you understand the way the enemy operates, you will never rejoice in opposition. But once you understand the way the enemy operates, you understand opposition is flattery. And the devil never goes to war where there are no spoils. I said the devil never goes to war where there are no spoils. And one of the great hints about what God is doing in you should be the level of opposition you consistently face. Because even, even if you don't understand what's going on, the enemy is so afraid of you tapping into everything God said you were going to be, so he will begin to establish opposition around you to hopefully prevent you from becoming... Because let me tell you, the enemy pushed Saul around when he was on the throne, but the enemy knew if this barefoot, dancing, hard playing poetry-writing boy ever gets on the throne, I am not going to push David around. He is too much of a worshiper to be pushed. He is too much of a worshiper to be manipulated he'll stay in the presence of God until he causes Israel to become everything God said they would be and I want to tell you right now some of you have been at arm's distance from the real purpose of God in your life for years and you have never pressed into the ultimate purpose of God in your life because the expense has been so great and you have been frustrated because preachers forgot to tell you that the word of the Lord was not something that was without opposition. The word of the Lord is not something that is without opposition. When God decided to send a revival here in Brownsville, the devil did not go on vacation. He brought in reinforcements and he said, this thing has got the potential to turn into a real mess for us. And he still hadn't left. Huh? Uh, and, and, and you would think after a while he would see his plans backfire to the point that he'd just get out of Dodge. No, what I'm going to do, I'm going to let the building catch on fire. That's a good idea. That's turned out real good for you, hadn't it, devil? Let's get the revival on the news again. Let's get some more free advertisement for what's going on and let people know the revival's not over. It's just getting started. The devil has never learned how to leave well enough alone. He's never learned how to pack his stuff and get out of town while he still can somehow save what little bit of face he's got. He'll keep pushing you till either you quit or you win. I said he'll keep pushing you till either you quit or you win. He will not push you until you lose. It is important for you to understand the enemy cannot kill what God is doing in you. Whew. That ought, to, that ought to got somebody happy just right off the bat. I said, the devil cannot kill what God is doing in you. If he could, he would. So I have found out that the opposition of the enemy is not just to try to kill what God's doing in you, but rather is to try to get you to kill what God's doing in you. God spoke it to me like this. Let me share it with you like this said, the enemy cannot kill the purpose of God that is growing in you, so he will attempt to facilitate the aborting of the purpose of God that is moving in you. Nobody or nothing can stop me from doing what God has called me to do but me. Catch that. So if you're not operating under the, per, under the will of God for your life, you're not moving in the purpose of God for your life, quit blaming it on the preacher who fell. Quit blaming it on the church who split. Quit blaming it on who talked bad about your grandma and them. Quit blaming it on the fact that they don't put you in the choir and nobody gives you the opportunity to sing a solo and I should have been on staff by right. Throw all the excuses out the window and realize if you're not doing what you should be doing, it's nobody's fault but... Then look, friend, what's going on on the inside of me, the devil can't kill, and I have learned that he can't kill it. He'll tell me he's going to kill it, and it keeps living. People will tell me it's going to die, and it keeps living. 
Oh, you got you should have caught that one. I said, people will tell me it's going to die. If I'd have quit every time people told me I needed to quit, I wouldn't even be here tonight. But I have found out whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment shall be condemned. If God be for me, who can be against me? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world you go find somebody that's doing something in the kingdom sit down and talk with them and if they tell you they ain't had trouble then they're not really doing anything David got anointed king and a bear and a lion showed up <clears throat> huh. I thought once I got to be anointed you know everybody running around wanting the anointing I don't even know what the anointing, most people don't even know what the anointing is. They want the anointing. You want a chill bump. <laughs> the anointing. I want the anointing. I have people getting a prayer line all the time. Brother Damon, I want you to lay hands on me and give me a double portion of your spirit. And no, you don't. Because <laughs> if you want double what I got, you got to go through double what I went through. Are you sure you want to get in that line? Like I can just throw my coat on them and they get it. Whew. No, friend, it doesn't work like that. You hear me? You hear me? People say, well, Elijah got all he had to do was get the mantle. All he had to do was get the mantle. No, first he had to kiss his mom and daddy goodbye, set the 12 yoke of oxen on fire, burn the tools he was plowing with so he could prevent himself from backsliding. And then he had to make up my mind, I'm not stopping at Gilgal, I'm not stopping at Bethel, I'm not stopping at Jericho, and I'm not stopping on the other side of Jordan. I'm going to follow this man until I start seeing what he sees and hearing what he hears. And if I can see what he sees, I can have what he has. We think as all, we all want to get in the cheap, easy, quick line. But to be effective is expensive. I said to be effective is expensive. It is so expensive that most believers are ineffective. That's why God sends his spirit like he sends his spirit. And revival is he's trying to teach you you can be more than saved. He's trying to get you to understand that there is a time bomb of destiny that's waiting to go off on the inside of you. And if you would ever surrender yourself to the plan of God in your life, God wouldn't just use some big shot to heal the sick and raise the dead. He'd use you to heal the sick and raise the dead. And the church will never progress to being what it needs to be in the earth until we quit depending on a few people to do for us what all of us are supposed to be doing. I'm glad that this day of big shot superhero preaching stuff's coming to a close. It's not closed yet, but it's on the way. I have, I have prayed and asked God, and he's done a wonderful job of doing it, to keep me in obscurity for absolutely as long as possible. Because I hate when people come to church over somebody's name. Because at that moment you just said you were there for them, I'm going to tell you they can't give it to you. But the moment you come into the presence of God when you ain't ever heard of the preacher, then you just made a statement, I'm not here because of the preacher, I'm here because of the glory. God's doing something in the earth right now and you're going to find that the next wave of people that are really used to shake the kingdom of darkness, most of them you've never heard of. Because we've been hidden in a season of obscurity. We've been beating bears and lions with nobody watching before we ever had a chance to kill a giant with everybody watching. And the level at which you will allow God to use you to kill bears and lions when nobody's watching is going to ultimately determine how God uses you when everybody's watching. If you can be faithful, if you can be faithful to drive the adversary away from a lamb, not the whole flock, not most of the flock, not part of the flock. One lamb. Now I'm watching David here and I'm seeing the attack of the enemy come through this bear and come through this line and take a lamb. And what logic says is, man, you don't go to war against a bear and a lion over a lamb. Unless you understand that if the bear and the lion establish a pattern of being able to take from you, They'll rob you blind a lamb at the time. Mm. 
And all of our ministry we've done in Africa, I've talked to those guys about these lions that would attack these tribes of people that were hidden out in the bush. And they said, if that lion ever realizes he can kill that person and eat that person, you got to kill that lion because he'll come back night after night after night because he has found out that people are digestible. I can live off this prey. And what many people have done is they have established a pattern with the enemy that he can walk in and out of their world whenever he wants and take from them as long as he only does it a lamb at a time. The enemy is far too subtle to come into your life with you running a ring of pornography out of your basement. He doesn't work like that. He, it'll start a look at the time. It'll start a magazine at the time. It'll start a pay-per-view show at a hotel room at the time. It doesn't start with you being a full-blown pornographer. Child molesters didn't all of a sudden just become child molesters overnight. A lamb at the time, the enemy began to work in them to the point that he had established a pattern of being able to take from them, and he had talked them into believing he had a right to do it. David said, you know what? I refuse to go to sleep with a lion and a bear developing the mentality that they can take from me. Some of you are in the process right now in this season of your life and either the enemy's going to teach you he robs from you or you're going to teach him you rob from him. But somebody's going to class and you're going there right now. You want, to tell you, how, you, want to tell me, you want me to tell you how people get out of church? A tithe check at a time. You don't just all of a sudden backslide on God, quit paying your tithes and decide I'm quitting the church. Starts a check at the time. It starts a Wednesday night service at the time. It starts a revival service at the time. And next thing you know, there are, there are people here who came to this revival faithfully five years ago that hadn't been to this revival in two years. And you know what? They didn't just all of a sudden quit on revival. They stopped coming a lamb at the time. They quit praying. They start praying every other day instead of every day. They, quit, they start coming to church twice a week instead of four times a week. They start seeking the uh, face of God once a week instead of every moment of every day of the week. And next thing you know, a lamb at the time, they have found themselves removed from the purpose of God in their lives. And you have either got to take a lion and a bear to school or a lion and a bear going to take you to school. Some of you have had the enemy walking in and out of your lives for so long, he thinks he belongs there, and so do you. Walks into your health whenever he wants. Walks into your marriage whenever he wants. Walks into your children whenever he wants. And we sit there and cry and talk about, I can't believe this is happening to me. You've let it happen to you, a lamb at the time. If you'd have drove that dog out of your house the first time he came, you wouldn't have to be living being robbed from. If you'd have driven him out of your marriage the first time he came, instead of entertaining the thought of bailing out, then you might still be with who you're supposed to be with now. Uh-oh. And we slowly begin to back off of the passion that we once operated in. Some of y'all were living so right when Brother Steve Hill was in here three times a week naming every sin you'd ever done in your life and now that you don't have anybody naming your sin on a weekly basis, you'll let, him, you'll let the enemy come back in a lamb at the time. A lamb at the time. Some of you cleaned videos out of your house and you went right back to the store and bought them again. Uh-oh, I went there now. I'm getting in trouble now. Let me dig a little while. I'm, I like it when I hit a nerve. It just makes me want to mash even more. Kickback is a beautiful thing for a preacher. It lets me know that's a wall I was meant to beat on for a little while. If you don't pray as much as you did in 96, there'll be an altar call for you at the end of the service. You're backslidden. Now, I, let's, let me explain to you how I grew up. I grew up in these old-time Pentecostal churches. and I grew up where, I mean, everything in the world was sin, and I lived every moment of my life scared I was going to hell. I went through adolescence on the way to hell, I felt like. I grew, up, I grew up in that kind of church, but now we've turned the church in the complete opposite direction and nothing's sin. It's not a big deal anymore. Hey, just work it. Hello? 
But I want to tell you, God's doing something in the earth today where he's beginning to bring people back to the place where holiness is not something they do because they have to. It's something they do because they want to. The reason why I don't sin is not because I'm scared of going to hell. It's because I'm scared of cutting myself off from the presence of God. It's because I know sin's power to create a wall between me and the glory that I was intended to walk in. And I refuse to let anything cut me off from that. It's the most valuable thing I have. I got, I got confused growing up in that kind of church because everybody talked about people being backslidden all the time. I didn't know what backslidden meant, so I studied it out real, real good. Went into everything I could find about backslidden, broke the thing down. And the word backslide really means to slide backwards. Now, I know that's deep and heavy. I hope I had not got too heavy on some of you. But let me, in other words, if you're not as far forward as you used to be, guess what? I said, if you're not as far forward as you used to be, well, God's just not moving on me during this season. Get a grip. Sowing and reaping doesn't quit for certain seasons. If you put it in the ground, it's coming up. If you plant passion, you're going to reap passion. If you plant intimacy, you're going to reap intimacy. And if you're not getting what you want, you need to check what you've been planting. And the enemy will teach you, this is, oh, this is just a phase that everybody goes through. It's just a season. Some of you have been in winter for years because the enemy talked you into believing this was a season you are supposed to go through. So stuff's been dead for years. You've been waiting on it. Oh, one day I'm going to wake up and all of a sudden these things are going to start to bud again. That's a negative. Not going to happen. You're going to start to reap when you start to sow. And if you're not walking in the level of real intimate relationship with God you once did, I can assure you you're not sowing what you, what you once sowed. And if you'll go back to giving what you used to give, you'll go back to getting what you used to get. Oh, Lord. Oh, somebody. Somebody. Go ahead and go back home tonight and act like you did on, in 1995, 1996, 1997 when you were throwing stuff away. When you were cutting the cable off at the house because there wasn't that much trash on TV. And you wouldn't even let that kind of music get in your house. You wouldn't let that kind of music get in your car. You used to wake up in the morning. First thing you did was jump out the bed, roll over on the floor. and Lundi be kitili be on Because you couldn't wait to be in the presence of God. If you're not there anymore, it's not because God turned away. It's because you turned away. And tonight is a night for you to set your face back toward God's there was a divine mission growing on the inside of David and if the devil could have stopped David from becoming king he'd have never come after the lamb he'd have come after David he'd have just killed David and gotten it over with but he did not have the capacity to destroy David so what he did was he spent David's entire life trying to get David to kill himself once God called you to be king, the only person to stop you from being king is you. Once God told you you were going to the nations, the only person to stop you from going to the nations is you. Once God told you he was going to use you to heal the sick, the only person that can stop you from healing the sick is you. Once God told, oh Lord, once God told you he was going to use you to bring life to dead situations, the only person going to stop it from happening is you. You want to know what the enemy was after the day? The day he showed up for the... The lamb, what he was really after was David's confidence. Because the only thing that qualified David to kill Goliath was killing the bear and the lion. The reason why Saul said, David, I can turn you loose on Goliath is because he said, I can trust any man to kill a giant that's killed a bear and a lion. But if he would have let that bear and that lion take those sheep, he would have never been qualified to kill that giant. You are in the process in your life right now of determining what you are going to be qualified to do in the future. God said it like this. He said, if you're faithful over a little thing, I'll make you ruler over much. I mean, it's just a lamb, David. After all, you hadn't even really been ultimately called to be a shepherd. That's that God told you he was going to bless you and told you he was going to prosper you and you've been walking around waiting for a check to show up in the mailbox. You don't even balance your checkbook now. You're not going to balance your check when you got $38.5 million. You don't tithe when you make $14 a week. You sure ain't going to tithe when you make $14 million a month. Because you have got to establish a pattern in little things that's going to ultimately qualify you to be successful in big things. You've got to hear this, friend. 
You got, if you don't pray right now working that nine to five job, then what makes you think you're going to pray when you're preaching to thousands of people? If you can't press into God when you're at Brownsville School of Ministry, you are never going to be qualified to release people through the prophetic when you get out of Brownsville School of Ministry. I don't care how anointed you are. If you are not careful, you will abort the purpose of God in you a lamb at the time. We sit around and wait on like puff, pop, one day we're going to be powerful. You're in class right now to determine what you're going to do in the future. You are in the school of the Spirit right now that is going to ultimately either qualify or disqualify you to become who God intended for you to be in the earth. Some of you sitting back waiting on God to come find you. I've been called to be an evangelist. Hadn't won a soul in years, but waiting for a tie and a suit and some slick shoes and some business cards and some letterhead and a calendar because that's what evangelist means look joker if you can't win those people at work with you every day what in the world makes you think you're gonna go to uganda hold a crusade and save a country am i helping somebody in here god's called me to be a preacher and quit waiting on ordination papers to start preaching you go to work with people who need to be saved every day. Try your stuff out. Well, I hadn't been ordained. Everybody ought to be able to bootleg a little bit. You understand bootleg, don't you? That means I don't have a liquor license, but I run a steal at the house. That's, that's Alabama vernacular. I hope it's not losing any of you. I want you to understand that what you are in the middle of doing and not doing now is in the process of determining what you will do and will not do in the future. I didn't learn to whip a devil when I got on jets and start flying around preaching. I learned to whip a devil in a 16 by 70 foot single wide trailer with no telephone stuck out in the middle of woods somewhere and said, if God really did call me to do this, devil, let's get some stuff straight. You're not going to tell me how I'm going to live. You're not going to tell me what I can't have and what I can't have. I'm going to tell you how you're going to live. I'm going to tell you what you can't have. We're going to turn the tables now. For years, a lot of us have been letting the enemy dictate to us what we can't have and what we can't have. You got to turn that stuff around. Enemy tells you when to jump, when to sit, when to stand, when to smile, when to cry. No. No, sir. You have got to change the way you relate to the enemy. Because many of you right now, he's the one that holds the confidence in the way you relate to him. And the scripture says, cast not away your confidence, for with it is great reward. And you have got, I'm telling you, some of you, when God first began to move in your life, first began to move in this church, first began to move in revival, you just knew if God turned you loose right then, you had the ability to turn the entire world upside down. But a lamb at a time, you are not operating in the kind of confidence you once operated in. And the Spirit of God sent me in here tonight to tell you that tonight there's going to be a restoration of confidence that's going to begin to come to people in the same way you used to broadcast this thing you're going to begin to broadcast this thing the same way everybody you ran into you used to tell them what God was doing you're gonna to begin to tell them what God is doing again because confidence is beginning to explode in you all over again you will never be effective without confidence you will never have boldness without confidence the two walk hand in hand listen to what I'm telling you friend God is in the process right now of showing you that all those lambs you thought were not a big deal because you're supposed to be a king have the potential to cause you to disqualify yourself from being what God called you to be. But because how are you going to ever pastor people if you can't take care of lambs? Well, God's going to use me. 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 God, and that thing's always in the future because you have never seized the opportunities that are available for God to use you now. One of these days when I get this stuff straightened out, I'm going to be mighty. 
Mighty will always be a day away until you start straightening some stuff out. Now, can you see the bear and the lion walking off of that lamb? And David start running after it. This is a bad cat. You just don't want to. This joker is bad. He'll break off running after a bear and a lion, tap it on the shoulder and say, excuse me, that's mine. If you give it to me, I'm going to turn around and walk back, but you turn on me, I'm going to mess you up. I was at some friend's house down in Georgia. They, had a, they pastor a church outside of Atlanta, powerful church, God doing awesome things at this church in a little city called Bremen, Georgia. And many of them have been here in this revival and that some of the different times that I've preached and come for, uh, for different, different ministry times and different conferences and things. And, and God released a word into our ministry that this couple was going to have a child. And they'd been trying to have a child for years and never could get pregnant. And God released a prophetic word. And inside of 10 months of that prophetic word, they were holding that baby. And God released that word into their lives. I happened to be at their house the first time. That little girl's name is Zion. And I've preached about that little Holy Ghost seed of God all over the world. This little girl named Zion, I happened to be at their house the first time Zion ever got a whipping. We call it a whooping in Alabama, but first time she ever got a whipping. And they have in their house, they have a beautiful fireplace with a, with a hearth and a mantle, and there's some sharp edges on the brick of that hearth. And Zion would start to crawl over there toward that hearth, and her mama would get down on the floor, and she would look at her, and she would say, No. So she'd stop for a minute and about till her mama got back to the chair and then she'd start crawling toward the hearth again. And her mama get down there, look at her face and said, Mama said no. Mama goes sit down, she start crawling to the hearth again. So she reached down there right back on the fat part of the back of that little leg and shh. That girl screamed like the world was coming to an end. I mean, how could the woman who have, I've entrusted my life with now become the thing that hits me? How foreign a concept. She's the one that when I hurt picks me up. She's the one when I'm hungry picks me up. And now what in the world am I going to do with myself? The one I'm trusting has done turned on me and started hitting me now. And as I was there all weekend long staying in their house, every time that little girl would crawl back to the spot where she got that whipping, she'd start screaming. She knew that that spot equaled pain. I have been here before, and when I was here, it hurt. And now that I'm here again, I should be experiencing hurt. This spot equals pain. I want to establish the kind of relationship with the enemy. When he comes over into my stuff, he realizes this spot equals pain. Every time I come against his health, I have pain. Every time I come against his family, I have pain. Every time I come against his ministry, I have pain. And many of us, every time we get in an encounter with the enemy, we receive the pain instead to give the pain but I came all the way to Florida to tell somebody you've been receiving the pain long enough it's time for you to bring the pain so when he starts messing with your money he knows it's a bad idea because every time I touch their money pain every time I touch their body pain every time I touch their house they attend pain every time I mess with their pastor pain I better learn to leave these people alone because they've been whipping me for years and it looks like they're not gonna change their mind about what end of this stick they're holding David walked down and David strutted to a brook picked up five smooth stones and never had a problem with a giant because to him, that giant was nothing but another enemy of what God had called him to do in the earth. And he'd been whipping them for years. He, he was so insignificant at one stage that when Samuel showed up to Jesse's house, Jesse figured he was looking for Eliab and didn't even invite David to the anointing party. Until the prophet walked past all Jesse's sons and says, is there not any left of your house? And Jesse thought for a minute and said, there's just one, but he's probably not the one you're looking for. Just a ruddy young shepherd boy stuck out on the backside of nowhere taking care of sheep. Samuel said, go get him. Jesse said, sit down. Samuel said, I'm not sitting down till he gets here. My oil will not flow till it finds the right head. Go get me the king. I don't know, friend, what exactly you're waiting on, but God did not bring you into Brent. This, you, your attendance in this building tonight is a statement to me about your purpose. 
Because God has brought people into this church from literally all over the world that have great destiny and have found the, an anointing and found a passion and found a hunger to release the presence of God in the earth through their life. The fact that God brought you here, I don't care how average you feel. The fact that God brought you here is a great statement to me about your purpose in this earth. I want to tell you, God brought me into this place and there's stuff that happened to me through this revival that has literally not just changed the way I preach and changed the way I minister. That goes without saying. It's changed the way I live. And I refuse to let the enemy bring me back into an old way of living a lamb at the time. It was through what God's doing in this church. It was through the manifestation of the Spirit of God in this church that it began to revolutionize the way I prayed. And I went from being a person that prayed an hour a day to being a person that prayed all day. Worship was a part of the service I went through until we got to the preaching, until I began to be touched by this manifest presence of God. And then I went from being a person who worshiped to a worshiper and realized I can wake up in the middle of the night and the same spirit that hit that altar will hit my bed. Let me tell you something, friend. If you came in here tonight and you're not as stirred up as you were in days gone by, I want to tell you, you've been robbed from. You hear me? you've been robbed from as awesome as the things I've seen in my life have been I refuse to become one of these preachers that talks about what God did years ago I'm not going down that road I've seen God do some awesome things in my 20s and when I'm in my 30s I'm not gonna be talking about what God did in my 20s when I'm in my 40s I'm not gonna be talking about what God did in my 30s I want to stay in the middle of what God is doing in the earth and I know how to do it is to continue to sow towards it If I had, if, if we could take the time to do it tonight, I could call every one of you up here one by one. And if you'd get honest instead of religious and tell what God called you to do, it would, it would blow most of the people in here's minds, the destiny that is inside this house right now. If I sat up here right now and told you what I dreamed about, some of you would call me arrogant. If I told you where I'm going, what God called me to do, some of you would call me conceited. But I'm tell you, I'm doing it. I said, I'm doing it. I remember, I'm going to tell you some stuff that'll mess you up. Right now, I walked into this church in that other building, sat over in that other building in a pair of shorts, a flip-flop, a ball cap, turned around backwards, a sunburn, leaned up against the wall, and the Spirit of God told me, you'll preach in here. I turned around and told the guy that was my pastor at the time, he laughed at me. Guess what? He ain't my pastor anymore. I got a hold of a pastor who believed God really would do what he said he was going to do and wouldn't try to limit me by where I come from, what I know, and all that stuff. It wasn't that much longer. I preached in that building. I'm preaching in this building. And I want to tell you something. The only thing that could have stopped what's going on in my life and ministry right now at this age was me. Because people came against it, but they were ineffective. The enemy came against it, but he was ineffective. Religion came against it, but it was ineffective. Family members came against it, they were ineffective. Because the, the thing that called me to be here is the thing that kept me here, and that is the mission, the destiny, and the purpose of God in my life. Do not be robbed from. Did you hear me? I want to tell you this, friend. I'm about to move into another phase with this service. I want to tell you this. Compromise is the tool the enemy will use to abort what God called you to do. And when you pick up the tool of compromise, you have taken the first step toward aborting the divine purpose of God in your life. People don't overnight quit on what God called them to do. They begin with compromise, and before they know it, compromise has become a tool to pull the divine purpose of God from them. And there are men and women of... Let me tell you something right now. No pastor I have ever met in my life got into the ministry and when he started a church said, you know what, I hope in 20 years I'm pastoring 30 people. I've never met an evangelist that when God called him into the ministry and he got on the road and began to travel, told himself, you know, when this thing's over with, I'm going to be working two jobs, one on the night shift and one on the day shift and preaching twice a month every time I can when I'm not welding on the side. 
When people came into this revival and the presence of God began to manifest on their lives, all of a sudden people began to dream big things. They began to dream extraordinary things. They began to have visions about God using them in the earth. And friend, if it's not still happening, it's not because God changed his mind. If right now, just us, nobody else, if just the group of people in this room right now got serious about the purpose of God in their lives, this nation would be in trouble. Hell's assignments over the people of this nation would be in sore jeopardy. Just us. If we got serious about what God called us to do in the earth and refused to back off a lamb at the time. I want to ask you tonight. You know, I've, I've been in this church several times and I, as preachers, we, uh, most preachers have got a top ten list of messages they like. And I have never in all the time of coming into this church gotten to preach a message that I would actually say is one of my favorite messages to preach. Because I'm never allowed to come in here outside of the prophetic. There's a prophetic release in this church. And every time I've ever come into this church, I start hearing God. If you come into this church without hearing God, it's not because God doesn't talk in here. I'm, I'm proof God talks in here. I've laid in these floors. Now I've laid, I mean, I mean, before I got to come in here and preach, I used to have to go sit in the Sunday school classroom like the rest of you. Some little old lady come up to me, put her head on, her fingers on my head like this. You know, she came up to about right here. She put her head, first time I ever came in here, I was standing there like, Lord, I can't believe. I should be Steve Hill, Pastor Kill, Patrick laying hands on me. I got some old lady back in here praying for me. She can't even hardly reach my head. Lord, this is she looks like she needs me to lay hands on her, and she's going to lay hands on me. And she stuck her head up there and her little, her little badge on. She said, more Lord, 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 more Lord. And I'm sitting there thinking, boy, she's got a real heavy-duty prayer life. The only words she seems to know is more Lord, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord. Next thing I remember, I'm stuck to the wall, laid up over in the corner, and can't even remember what happened. More Lord, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord. And when I got out of that floor, I never read the Bible the same again. When I got out of that floor, whew, I feel this. Oh! When I got up out of that floor, I never prayed the same way again. When I got up out of that floor, I never preached the same way again. When I got up out of that floor, I never lived like I used to live. And I can tell you what God did in me then, He's still doing in me now! How many of you got a similar story? Come on. How many of you in here got a similar story? First time I came into this, came into this church, I pulled into the parking lot with a bunch of hot shot preachers. And we had somebody that was going to meet us and bring us in because we weren't going to wait in line like everybody else. And I got out of the car and I said, this is, looks like I don't know what this is. What's going on down here? There's revival. I've seen revival. I grew up in revival. Next thing I know, I was leaning against the car. And everybody else went in the building. I said, I I'm going to catch you fellas in a minute because I don't think my legs will work right now because I want to tell you something, friend. I walked in here tonight and I got that. I walked, Brother Lindell brought me in here and told me where I was supposed to sit and I couldn't sit down. And I knew I was supposed to sit down. And everybody else was sitting down. I knew I was supposed to sit down, but I stood there. And this thing began to go. And I want to tell you, my God, if you're not still living in that place, you are missing life. If you are not still living in that place where every time you come into this house, the glory of God begins to cause you to expect that this might be the night God turns you upside down. If you're not still there, you need to repent, get on your face, and say, God, change me all over again. That night I came in here and flip-flopped some blue jeans. Steve Hill laid hands on me four times before the night was over. He laid hands on me one time in the, in the regular little prayer line where everybody was. I was just hanging out in the back back there just minding my own business. And he, didn't, he didn't know who I was in. He don't know who I am now. He came back and laid hands on me in the back of the church. I hit the floor and about the time I got up, he came running across the top of the chairs and laid hands on me again. Before that night was over, he laid hands on me four times. And the last time he laid hands on me, he said this. He said, you are going to see something in your life that's going to dwarf anything we've ever seen at Brownsville. I'll never forget it. Dwarf. Here I am standing there. I've never preached to more than 100 people in my life. 
And this man's telling me I'm going to see something that's going to dwarf anything I've ever seen in Brownsville. But I want to tell you, that thing was real to me. And the enemy has come with bears, and he's come with lions, and he's come with giants, and he's tried to get me to quit on that. Shoo, I feel this thing messing with me in here. He's come with people. He's come with preachers. He's come with people dressed and clad in a prophetic coat that did not have a prophetic anointing that said God wasn't going to do it, and God's not going to do it like that. And you got caught up in revival, and you got caught up in the hype. I got caught up in the hype then. I'm caught up in the hype now. And God is still doing what he said he was going to do. God is not not a man that he should lie come on somebody God is still doing what he said he was gonna do God is still doing what he said he was gonna do stand up on your feet I want, I'm gonna give you a news flash in case you didn't know because there's so many visitors here who had to raise their hands tonight in case you didn't get the message, everything God spoke about the purpose of this church in this nation has not been accomplished. Everything God said about the purpose of your life has not been accomplished. And the only way it won't happen is if you quit on it. Let me tell you, God's going to do through Brownsville Assembly of God everything he said he was going to do. The only variable in the equation is your involvement. Because there's a seed of people here not about to quit. There's a seed of people here who have not yet begun to fight. <laughs> There's a seed of people here who are not tired of pushing. There's a seed of people here who are not tired of praying. There's a seed of people here who are not tired of worshiping. There's a seed of people here that are going to continue to press toward the mark of the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. He's still going to do everything he said he was going to do. As much as he's still going to do it, I declare I'm not going to miss it. Hear that? As much as he's still going to do what he said he was going to do, I'm not going to miss what he said he was going to do. David said, Saul, I can take care of Goliath. They saw, Saul said, you're going to have to explain that. He said, let me tell you a story. A bear and a lion came to my father's flock and took a lamb. I took care of them. I'll take care of him. Because they were an enemy to what I've been called to do in the earth and I have made a practice of defeating foes of the purpose of God in my life. I taught the enemy, you won't rob from me when I'm a shepherd and if you don't rob from me when I'm a shepherd, you're sure not going to rob from me when I'm a king. Whew, I feel this thing moving in here right now. I feel this thing moving in here right now. I want to tell you, friend, if you begin to fall back into some of the old ways before God began to manifest this thing in your life, then you do not need to wait another minute, another week, another month to repent. You need to get on your face like you got on your face before and say, God, I need you to renew in me a passion for you. And you need to begin to separate yourself from sin the same way you separated yourself from sin in days gone by. You need to separate yourself from doubt the same way you separated yourself from doubt in days gone by. You need to separate Separate yourself from the curse and connect yourself to the blessing. You need to get in the middle of what God is doing right now. If the best was, on, was past us, then my destination right now would be heaven. But I didn't come in here tonight hoping to get to heaven. My, uh, you, yes, I'm going to heaven. That goes without saying. But God put all this stuff in me so that we could see this kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Revi Look, I could have got to heaven without revival. I said a prayer December 12, 1986, a 12-year-old boy at a contemporary Christian concert got saved. Heaven was my home that day. This revival is about more than getting me to heaven. I know it's going to get a lot of you to heaven, but it's about more than that. It's about more than just getting you to heaven. It's about more than just getting you saved. It's about getting you a part of the business of making sure other people don't go to hell and they end up in heaven. There is purpose all over this room tonight. There's destiny all over this room tonight. 
And some of you are standing in a place of compromise. You have sat down at a table called fear in a seat called compromise. And you are missing much of what God could be doing with your life in this earth. So we're about to have an altar call. But in this altar call, I'm not going to ask uh, simply those of you who have never come to the altar before to come. I believe there's many of you that came to the altar at one time and for some reason you came in here tonight and you are not living with the kind of passion that you lived toward God in years gone by and days gone by and months gone by, whatever the case may be. If you need your heart to be turned toward God like it never has been before and you need to say, I've fallen away from much of the things of God that I was pursuing at one season of my life, you need to make a change and you need to make a change now. We've, we've made the mistake of believing that repentance is a one-time event. It's not. I live repenting. I live changing my mind. I live turning from evil toward righteousness. I live turning from the curse toward the blessing. I'm learning to live day by day. I want to tell you, friend... The reason why God brought you into this church tonight and the reason why God connected many of you to this church in, in years gone by is because there is something powerful that He intended for you to do with your life. Not just to vicariously live through the great people that come out of here. Become one of the great people that comes out of here. If you're in here tonight... Maybe you've never met the Lord. Maybe you've fallen away from the Lord. Or maybe you are simply dealing with issues of sin that are keeping you separated from God. Maybe there was a day in your life where you served God more passionately than you're serving Him right now. You've been touched by the fire in the past. But I want to tell you, God didn't bring you here to try to teach you to live off the past. He wants to touch you with the fire now. It seemed amazing to me earlier in the service that when Brother Lindell began to play, he, uh, he starts singing, send the fire. And I said, well, that's kind of ironic to, send it, to ask God to send the fire here. I mean, pretty much done that, hadn't we? <laughs> send your fire, send your fire, send your fire. And I was thinking, and then God took me to Zechariah. Zechariah said this. He said, in the time of rain, I pray for rain. Whew. In the time of the fire being sent, I pray for the fire. God, I hadn't had enough of this stuff yet. What you did in Father's Day 95 was just to get me to where I am right here. This thing's not over. It's just getting started. Enough is never enough. I'm not about to quit. I believe the best is yet to come. If you're in here tonight and you've let sin creep back in, friend, you've let compromise creep back in, and it's robbed you of your confidence. Before we go any further, before you can worry about the opinions of another person and let pride begin to question your movement, right now, if you are sick of being separated from God through sin, I want you to get out of your seat. Come down here. Now, move. Come. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, don't walk. Get down here. Come on. What are you waiting on? Come on. Nindo bosti andele beki dile biondo boka. Be andele bakan dile beki sto. Mande be he tele biondo. Bande be ki tele biondo bosti andele baka. Come now. Come now. Come now. Come now. Now is the time. Now is the time. Come on. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come. There's room on this side. There's room on this side. Come. Press in. Press in. Press in. Tonight is a night of change. I declare fire burns in you fresh and new. Mercy falls on you, fresh and new. Go. Oh, as you come, Brother Lindell's going to begin to lead us, and we're going to begin to sing together. I want to invite you, don't stay in your seat when God's got freedom for you at this altar. Come now. I need you more. Come on. More than yesterday, I need you, Lord. Come on. Keep coming. More than words Keep to say, I need you more. Tonight, let tonight be the than night. ever before, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Come on down. I need you more. Come on. Come on, friend. He'll touch you here. More than yesterday. He'll touch you here right now. I 
you not to leave here tonight till somebody laid their hands on you and prayed for you and I believe that the Spirit of the Lord has instructed us tonight that there's gonna be a restoration of confidence that's gonna to begin to come into this place one of the first things that needs to happen for you to become more than a person who comes to revival in order for you to become a person that carries revival you've got to have confidence birthed on the inside of you and you've got to be walking in fresh boldness to become not just a person who knows where revival is, but knows how to bring revival where it needs to be. Whew. Before you get out of this house tonight, I want to tell you there's, there's prayer workers, there's prayer counselors, and there's intercessors who have given their life to make sure you get prayed for, given their life to make sure you get touched by the power of what's going on in this place. And don't leave here tonight without receiving whatever you think you've got to rush off to. It's not as important as the impartation God wants to release into you in this altar through the laying on of hands. So all of our prayer workers, I want you to get ready. We're going to start off by beginning to move in and among and through these that are down here at the altar. We're going to begin to pray for them. We're going to lay hands on them we're going to begin to speak release into their life I want to tell you something especially those of you that live around this area even those of you that traveled in here tonight I believe one of the greatest tools that has ever been given to the body of Christ in this country is the tool of what God has done in this church and if, if I had the opportunity to take you with me tomorrow morning when my wife and I get on a plane fly to Kansas City and show you what God is doing in Kansas City because a pastor who's been touched by this. And then I could take you once a month to a church in Rochester, Michigan, where we have revival a Friday and a Saturday night every month. And I could show you an entire region that's being revolutionized by people who got touched. One of the deacon's wives came back to the church service there in Rochester. The pastor asked her to share a testimony about what God had done. That was six years ago. And they're still flowing in revival, moving in the things of the Spirit right now. One of the greatest tools I believe God's ever given to the body of Christ in America is this outpouring of the Spirit at this church. Don't miss what God's going to release into your life in this altar tonight. Do not miss it. God didn't bring you here so you could just sit through another sermon and so you could sit through some more music. God brought you here not only to change you but cause you to become an agent of change in the earth. And I declare you are going to experience great confidence and renew energy to believe God's going to still do what he said he was going to do through your life. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Let's just lift our hands. Just continue to sing there, man. Let's lift your hands all over this place. Counselors, you can begin to move in among and through these. Begin to pray. Our altar workers, just begin to move and pray for those. I need you. Come on, let's lift our voice. Just begin to pray. Begin to move. Come on, receive what God's got for you tonight through the laying on of hands. More than words can say.
Get ready to receive right now. Get ready to receive. They're moving. Come